Hello and welcome to the PropTech Hot Seat on iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon, the show where we explore trends and technologies driving innovation across the built environment. The show is brought to you in partnership with PropTech Ireland, the hub for innovators, investors and indeed for industry leaders. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Chintan Sonny, CEO of Equilibrium. Chintan, you're very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Carl, and thank you for having me. Um, I'm delighted and I'm excited about what we're going to be chatting about today because we talk a lot about sustainability. The industry is saying all the right things. Now we want to see the do, or it's, if it's doing all the right things, which is the more important uh, metric. So for people who might not be familiar, tell us a little bit about Equilibrium and the, the work that you and your team are doing. So we are a, we are a 10-year-old organization. We work with medium and large industrial, commercial uh, and data center enterprises, and we help them accelerate their uh, decarbonization journey, but at the same time, help them reduce their operational cost and empower their team on the ground to be able to take better decisions. Um, so essentially, we are a technology partner for enterprises to accelerate their decarbonization journey. Um. You know, decarbonization and digitalization, they're the two biggest trends, not just across construction and real estate right now, but really across the industry. So it's it's interesting that you're working across real estate, data centers and manufacturing. But to have gone into that a decade ago, uh, were you were you coming from an industry? Had you been involved in real estate or manufacturing previously? Um, I mean, personally, no. I used to work for a telecom company, uh, and I spent more than a decade uh, with a telecom company. And uh, and for me, digitization came naturally. Uh, we then gave it a lens of energy because I think energy is ten years ago. Energy was looked at just from the perspective of cost, but today. It is not just cost. Energy is looked at from the perspective of making our planet greener. And energy is also uh, being looked at from the perspective that we are making our businesses future-proof, not just from the business perspective or profitability perspective, but also for our generations to come. Um, I, I, I like when... Uh, we position uh, energy savings in terms of, you know, when we when we look at projects, whether it's for a new build uh, across the built environment or indeed we're looking at a portfolio. We talk about the two budgets, your cash budget, your carbon budget. And that's a that's a reality of where we are now. But I think it's interesting you coming from a telecoms background because energy is being approached maybe not in the way that we might have approached telecoms for a number of reasons. One of those, yes, is sustainability. Uh, one of those is around maybe an increasing urgency, although not as not as much of a sense of urgency as we'd like to see around energy security and, and energy provisions. But um, I, I suppose we're also operating in a time when companies are not just looking at their their bottom line. They need to be more mindful about how, you know, the, the planet has become one of their stakeholders and they already had a fairly wide list of stakeholders previously. So what from your telecoms experience can you see that you were able to bring in to maybe have a little bit of advanced knowledge about how telecom or how energy and particularly renewable energies uh, might be deployed? Well, from... From my perspective, the biggest advantage that we ha- I have coming in from a telecom background is to provide the first step in energy efficiency or carbon reduction. The first step is visibility. Look, you have enterprises and companies going to announcing publicly that they're going to be net zero carbon or they're going to be carbon neutral in 2035, 2050, 2060, whatever. But the fact is, do they know where they are today? Mostly no. And even if they know where they are, the frequency of the update that they get in terms of where they are is probably once in six months or once in a year, right? And for me, Real-time data 
is the most important bit, which is I want to know what am I consuming today. I don't want to know what have I consumed when I get my bill, right? And if I know what I'm consuming today, and if there is a deviation, if there is an increase or a decrease, I can take an action. So if you really want an action-driven plan for energy reduction or carbon reduction, you need real-time data. When we launched our platform in 2012, 2013, um, the kind of people that we used to work with, which is manufacturing. We started with manufacturing and people who are on the shop floor uh, looking at how much is being produced and, and all of that. They would only know what their energy consumption was once a month, which really means that if there was something wrong and there was a fluctuation in terms of increase of energy, they would not know. So when we went in and we said that, look, you will be able to see real-time energy consumption of every equipment in your plant it was a surprise for them and, and it was i i think it's interesting to reflect on your customers back in 2012 and 2013 because and this is an assumption so please please set me right but back then how much of their consideration the reason that they were speaking to you was around the planet uh, as a stakeholder and how much was around achieving cost efficiencies and saving money? 100% cost efficiencies, zero planet. The, the only reason they wanted to know what their real-time energy consumption was was because they could reduce their cost of energy. Now, if you look at a manufacturing setup, yeah. right, you don't have a lot that you can control. You mm -hmm. can't control the cost of raw, raw materials. You can't control the cost of people, which is employment. You can't control the capital expenditure that you would put in in setting up a plant. But the only thing that you have in your control is how you use energy. And when I say energy, it's not just electricity. It's water, gas, yeah. all of that, right? And that is where your margins get affected the most. So everyone was looking at cost efficiencies more than anything else. 10 years back. Conversation fast, today. Yeah, fast forward 12 years. The 10 people, years, I new, would say. The new customers uh, yeah. you're speaking to. My first conversation with the customers today is about their carbon footprint. And when I tell them that we can help you accelerate your digitization, I mean, decarbonization journey by 10, 15%, while we are going to be able to reduce your cost of energy as well, that's what they want to hear. Because there's a notion in the industry that being green is not profitable. It's expensive. And we are here to defy that completely. For example, we've made energy reduction of around 15 to 25% which is a reduction of almost 18 to 19% of carbon footprint for them. So you see, it, now it's a double whammy where you are reducing your carbon footprint and you're reducing your cost. And it is not just the cost of uh, energy. But it also makes people more efficient on the ground, which means that you will be able to reduce your cost of manpower as well at the same time, make them more efficient. In yeah. case of commercial real estate, we've been able to reduce the cost of manpower by 40%. And I'm not saying reduce the number of people, but essentially you save 40% of the time of people who are on the ground so that they can do something better with the time. Yeah, uh, it, no, it, it makes total sense. And when you talk about uh, commercial real estate, I would put that very much into two brackets, you know, the old existing ones and the new ones. And we know that there is a huge difference in terms of not just the energy performance of both of those, but actually maybe the ambitions and maybe the ethos of the developers and portfolio owners as well. But what, what I find really interesting is that you're uh, across 
manufacturing and data centers, I would say you have those two extremes as well, because um, in my experience, those involved in data centers are probably the most aware consumers of energy. So therefore, actually, they're the most innovative in terms of investing in new solutions, or whether it's renewable. So they're actively trying to become problem solvers in this space. Whereas I would put manufacturers maybe still in the consuming and just trying to control their own consumption. So let's talk about manufacturers first, because then I definitely want to move on to data centers. But in terms of manufacturers, you said what's within their control. So actually, in terms of genuinely accelerating their decarbonization, uh, how how much of this is within their control? Like, yes, they can save money, but is do they need to invest a lot to be able to save money? Are you looking at new plant and machinery or is it is it how people are using energy? Is it the energy that they're actually using? How do you help manufacturers? So we come in with the mindset that whether you have to invest in new plant and machinery or you have to invest in um, in putting in more sensors to make it more digital, that's the second step. I think the first step is to understand and figure out where you are and how much can you sweat your existing plant. Once you've got a certain amount of efficiency, you then take the next step in terms of investing in either CapEx or technology. We come in with a very clear mindset that for a manufacturer, there are two things that we can create an impact on. One is that ability to produce more with the same cost of energy. That means it increases their revenue and increases their margin as well. The next step is how do you keep the increased production level and then reduce your energy consumption, which means that it then makes them even more profitable, right? And all of this, our intention is to use the existing sensor network, existing IT infrastructure, and not invest anything to start with. Once you know where the problem is, once you know where the inefficiencies are, you could then go and invest so that you can get a better ROI. From our perspective, wherever we've gone, our return on investment is less than 12 months. So the key is to not jump in and over digitize or put in so much capital expenditure that the return on investment doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I think the first thing is to figure out how much can you sweat your assets and then you increase the investment if need be. Um, I, I'm conscious that 10, 10, 11 years ago when you were starting out, the amount of data that maybe was being collected was much lower than it is now. Um, so, you know, in terms of using existing sensors or whatever IoT technology they they have, I mean, are you, do you find if you're dealing with new clients uh, or new customers in the manufacturing space, um, are they collecting a lot more data now than they were 10 years ago? There's a marginal difference. There's not a lot of difference. Uh, I mean, really? um, if you look at large there are a few customers who are advanced in terms of data collection, mm. but a large part of them are still using the traditional methods of walking around, taking readings, putting in a logbook, and then analyzing it over a period of time and see what's happening there. Um, and I come back to the same thing, which is a lot of, lot of the customers today are still in the mindset of driving decisions based on intuition and not based on data. And I think as a CXO, what you really need is data, not people telling you, I think we should do this, or I think this is how it needs to be done, or this is how it needs to be done. The data proves where the inefficiencies are, and it throws it out real time. So, you know, uh, I, I don't think there's a lot of advancement in manufacturing. However, data centers, mm. hugely advanced. Buildings becoming much, much better uh, in terms of data. Manufacturing, still I would say, 
Some um, day to go. Data versus intuition. Uh, so much of what we do uh, in our day jobs on a day to day basis, even with technology, provides on uh, experience, which feeds into fast decision making. And I think as more and more data comes on stream, you hope that that will be relied on. Uh, to make decisions, but we've seen it. We've we've seen it over the last number of years in a property and real estate context that people have so much information now that actually they're not sure how to handle it. Most wouldn't even have a data strategy uh, to manage it. But actually, there's definitely there's definitely dumb data. There's data that's not being used. So we're generating more. We're collecting more. And in my experience, lots of portfolio owners have no concept of what to do with that. And in fact, if anything, they're almost overwhelmed by it and taking a step back instead of forward. So actually, in a, a, you know, to, so to try, I feel like we've had a whole movement of trying to push the industry into data. And now we're introducing concepts like dumb data and smart data and, and, and complicating things. How do you navigate that? with uh with clients that you know are trying to do the right thing but they're overwhelmed by it i mean there are two parts to this one as a part of our product we've built a platform called smart sense and smart sense essentially acquires data from an existing sensor network cleans it aggregates it takes the important ones and looks at how a facility is performing where is it consuming energy? Why is it consuming energy there? What is, where are the leakages? And what should you do to fix these leakages? So essentially, what we're doing is we are converting raw data, raw unstructured data, into plain, simple recommendations. And if I can give you an example, we can look at data and say that your energy consumption has been 15% higher between 12 and 12.30 today. And it is because on the third floor of your building, there is an AHU, which is circulating air, has started to consume, has consumed more energy. And it has consumed 15% more energy because the motor of the AHU has started to degrade or has behaved not correctly and that's because the bearing of that motor has started to go bad so do you and have so, a diagnostic tool that's specific absolutely yes and these are the algorithms that we've built over the last 10 years and these are proprietary algorithms that that convert pure simple data into very simple recommendations so it could tell you please go and lubricate the bearing of the motor it's like a car, right? When you buy a car, the car manufacturer tells you that you have to get your car serviced every 10,000 kilometers. And you get it serviced every 10,000 kilometers. But what if the car has started to have a problem at 2,000 kilometers and you don't even know, right? Or the car is absolutely fine at 10,000 kilometers, you don't need to get it serviced. Now, if something can tell you that at 2,000 kilometers, the oil filter has started to clog or the fuel filter has started to clog. You need to just go and clean it. Rather than getting the entire car serviced, you would just go and clean the fuel filter, which means that your cost of maintenance also goes down. So your yeah. co overall cost of ownership of an asset goes down. And your car is healthy. I mean, you get your blood test done, right? Blood, blood work done every six months now. At, at a certain age. The reason you get your blood test done every six months is because you know what is wrong where. And the symptoms could be fever, which in this case, in a building, the symptom could be you, this room is not as warm as it should be or it is not as cold as it should be. But that's just a symptom. Yeah. You would have a smallest equipment at the tail end of the building which has started to malfunction. And that is causing the increase of heat in the room. Yeah. I, I, well, let's bring this back to real estate because I think for manufacturers, then there might be some very specific instances there in terms of plant uh, and equipment. 
So for real estate, you know, I mentioned there that we have the two extremes. You know, we have the newly built, you know, that that complies with um, current building regulations that is meeting best practice certifications for from an energy building performance and from um uh, from a, a user comfort uh, perspective. So that's the building that's generating a lot of data and probably has a good central uh, platform or dashboard that allows operators of that building to understand the data. Then that's the absolute minority of buildings today. Go to, let's look at the buildings that are more typical, those buildings that have been built over previous decades and even centuries. So in terms of the the portfolio, and I know um, just in terms of operation, I know Equilibrium isn't operating in the Irish marketplace as yet, but we hope to see you very soon. this side of the water very soon. But um, yes. uh, 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 based on, on the project experience that you have across Asia, Pacific, Middle East, and indeed right across the UK, um, you know, what are you learning about older real estate buildings and the same challenges that those owners have, uh, they have the same challenges as the owners of newly built properties in terms of decarbonization and and uh, managing their costs. So, I mean, are they how, how can you start to help them? Because obviously they're coming off a much lower base. Yeah. I mean, let's pick up the newer build first. It's an assumption that newer builds are energy efficient. Data versus intuition. Tell us Absolutely, what the data yes. tell us what the data tells us. It is if you look at a new bill and they are certified for lead and, and all of that, what it tells you is that all the equipments that are installed over there are a certain rating of energy consumption, which is which means that they're efficient. But what we ignore is how they operate. Because if you look at a building or a manufacturing or a data center, no equipment runs or works in isolation. It's in tandem with something else, right? So if all the equipments are energy efficient, but if they're not working in tandem with each other, you are still not energy efficient, which means that your operational efficiency of the entire building is not up to the mark. At an individual asset level or an equipment level, yes, you are efficient. But are you the most efficient as a building? No. And let me give you an example. Uh, I have seen property who are built two years, three years, and absolutely best in class equipments installed over there. On a weekday, there are four pumps running because the entire building is occupied. On a weekend, there is 2% uh, occupancy. You would see buildings running three pumps instead of one pump, which is what it takes to run that building on a weekend. Uh, and which means that you are losing efficiency or energy of those two pumps that are working throughout the day. And this the entire logic of how many pumps should work, how many AHU should work is set manually by someone who designed it. But if you look at the data, it tells you you don't need it, right? So new build. The old build have a very different set of challenges. And I must admit that if you have a real smart engineer on the ground, all of these operational things would be taken care of. And I've seen older generation engineers are so, so careful and very, very nitpicky about these things. And they used to run out. I think for old builds, as an equipment gets older, it starts to become less energy efficient. And the key decision is whether do you repair it or you replace it. And then when you decide to replace it, you need to know when. You look at the OEMs or manufacturer of equipment, they would come and tell you the life cycle of an equipment is five years. You have to change it. And owners, because they have to follow the rules, they would go and change it. 
I have seen buildings who would replace four boilers at the same time, huge boilers at the same time, because it was end of life, according to the OEM's prescription. But if I look at the data, all eight of them were really, really healthy, and it did not need to be replaced. So replacing it versus repairing it is one decision, and repairing it, oh, sorry, replacing it when is another big decision because there's a huge capital expenditure there. And the algorithms that we've built will come in and within three months tell you whether your equipment is healthy, unhealthy, and if it is unhealthy, why is it unhealthy? And that's the power of data. Uh, do you know, I, actually, this is the first time I've ever considered this because we always look at real estate, the physical building, and we probably pay slightly less attention to to the the um, equipment within the building. But actually, just back to our budgets there, and if if we accept that we have two budgets, a cash budget and a carbon budget, then actually, even if you're budgeting for the cash budget to be able to replace something when the manufacturer's uh, information shows that it has a lifespan of X, so whether it's five years or whatever it is, then actually replace it. You know, you would think that by replacing it according to the guidance, that you're keeping it at operational efficiency. So therefore, actually, you're doing the best thing in terms of its, uh, its yeah. the operate how it can operate. You're also uh, not just buying in new equipment, but then the old equipment has to be destroyed, repurposed, dumped, waste. Uh, does that get factored in? And that itself is a huge carbon footprint in itself. Yeah. So is that factored in actually to this carbon budget? I don't think so. I, yeah, I don't think people mm. ca budget that in their carbon footprint mm. or carbon budget. It is then passed on to the company who buys it and that becomes their carbon budget. So uh, I'm to me, the business case is clear. Um, I think it's interesting, the verticals that uh, Equilibrium are currently operating across. But actually, uh, I, I'm, I, I know that um, we, we've limited time today, but... Uh, sometimes I do get people emailing me saying, right, but how does it work? And so actually, I, I, I'm going to preempt that email coming into me after this show airs and ask you the question, Chinton, how does it work? What's the technology behind Equilibrium? So the technology is very simple, but um, we put in a gateway on a site to acquire data real time uh, of a building or a manufacturing plant or a data set. We then get the data real time, we clean the data, we aggregate the data, we contextualize the data, and we create a digital twin of the building, the plant, or data center down till its last equipment in that facility. And we then run our algorithms, which are proprietary algorithms. We have close to 80 algorithms or algorithms for 80 different kinds of equipment, which look at the data and starts to identify if the equipments are healthy and efficient or not. And it then looks at what is causing them to be unhealthy or inefficient and converts that into a recommendation which we have built over the last 10 years, which would tell the person on the ground, you need to do this to be able to make it healthy. And once he's completed that, he could feed it back into the system. Sometimes people don't do what they say. And the platform then very quickly catches that and says, oh, you said you've done this, but you've not done it. You need to do, go and do it again. So. So it's a single pane of glass of if you have 25 facilities uh, on the same dashboard telling you how you're performing in terms of your carbon, in terms of your energy efficiency, uh, and clearly highlights what the problem area is and what should be done. So in some sense, it's a dummies for decarbonization. Yeah. You know, what you're telling me there is that the technology is good and people are the problem, which I've long suspected anyway. Um, 
But in terms of, uh, and I know we need to wrap up now, but just again, because I, you know, we like to add value to um, construction and prop tech innovators who might be, you know, not as far advanced on their journey as you and the team within Equilibrium are. Um, how was your experience or how have you found uh, say uh, things like integrations over the past decade because you know this is you know the space that you're operating in has become an increasingly crowded space um, and one of the challenges we see is that every innovator thinks they're solving the most important problem because by the nature of the by nature of being a founder is that you have honed in on a problem that you believe is so important and that's that's why you're you're setting out to try address it. So because this is quite a crowded space, what we've seen is that actually there can be, you you know, going into a, a typical building. And I would imagine this is magnified when you're going into even standard manufacturing, not to mention um, data centers, because that's a, a different that's in a class all of its own. Um, but in terms of integration um, so that you can actually understand what what all of the different technologies across the building are doing. Um, when you go when you go in to a, a building, are you able to access all of the data that you need to access, or do you at this stage ever encounter technology where you can't integrate, so you can't actually get a reading on? Well, I I think this was a problem maybe five years back, not anymore. Um, data is easily available. One second, the stand the the integration has been standardized to a mm -hmm. large extent now and it's getting consolidated as well we haven't got a customer in the last five to six years where we've not been able to take data out that we want um, and it's become easier and easier now um, the protocols are being consolidated it's industry driven it's been adopted very very quickly we don't see a problem anymore except for areas where you still have electromechanical equipments which are not integrable and th those unfortunately have to be replaced yeah i would that's kind of a, a different one but um and perhaps i'm showing my age now but um i know our early dealings with prop tech founders and construction technology founders you know when we brought up the idea of integrations uh, for many founders, they simply couldn't understand why they had to because they really felt they had a comprehensive solution. Everybody thought they were solving all problems, not just the most important problem. So, in fact, and that's why we like to touch on it uh, as as regularly as possible on the show here. So that actually we can help founders know that integration is not something you do further down the line. Actually, if you're not in a position to integrate, then you likely won't be able to even have your tools or technologies trialed. Oh. Absolutely. Within the yes. building. Um, Chinton, you, you touched on something there that I, I might just ask you to explain before we finish up. You talked about consolidation of integrations. What do you mean by that? Um, I mean, are you thinking, are you talking about a centralized dashboard? Uh, what does consolidation of integrations mean? So let me give you a very simple example. When, when you look at energy meters right, in a manufacturing setup or a building or a data center, seven years back or eight years back, every energy meter would have a different protocol, which means that I would have to speak 25 languages, right? And I would get into a plant and suddenly I have a new energy meter, which doesn't talk this language. So I have to build a protocol for that. Today, it's just one language or it is just one protocol, which is Modbus for example, and, and it's easy to integrate. Um, in a building, you have a BMS. When we connect to the BMS, it's very easy to integrate because most of the BMSs today support something called as MQTT. Uh, or if you look at a manufacturing setup, you have a PLC and you have OPC as a protocol, which is widely implemented and it's easily available. So for us, if we were to look at the number of integrations that we need to do today, not development, but just integration, not more than three to four. Yeah. So, so yeah. it becomes easy for us to hook into a building or a manufacturing setup or a data center, and we can get the site live in like three to four days. It's as easy as that now. 
Very good. So I, I again, it's just interesting to reflect because you would have been um, really an early pioneer in this space. You know, we're meeting people who are coming into this, uh, trying to innovate a solution just in very recent years. So it, it's good to get the perspective and maybe how things have changed and evolved or maybe not as much as we would like to think um, over the past decade. So uh, you've, you've shared enough to keep the industry happy. Now, now speak to some of the founders, whether it's prop tech or construction technology, who are only in years one, two or three. They're just starting out. They're where you were six, seven, eight years ago. Um, offer, uh, you know, for those who were actually selling into the built environment, you know, what what would have been helpful for you to know or what can you share that would really help founders in your position today? I think the only thing that I have, I would say is that you start with the problem that you want to solve. Most of the founders or even asset owners focus a lot on technology. Where what is the problem that you want to solve remains un unanswered. And once you know what the business objective is, it's easier to apply technology relatively easy to apply technology. But when you start with technology, like you mentioned earlier, you have so much data then, you just lost and you just don't know what to do. So the strategy should be business objective first, technology second, and not technology first and business objective second. So, so you can then decide how much technology do you need to implement to be able to reach the business objective and not vice versa. And I suppose final question, you know, we talked about how you might have been going out and selling your product um, 11 or 12 years ago. Uh, and that was purely on a cost savings metric because that was that was the value that the industry wanted to, to see at that time. Uh, your advice for founders going out and trying to sell to the to the real estate industry today. Sorry, can you say that? Um, just well, no. I'm just uh, wondering. Uh, do you have any advice for founders going out and trying to sell into the real estate industry today? So we know that you had to sell on the basis of cost savings, uh, but that's well, more than a decade ago. For for founders going out and trying to sell to the real estate industry today for the first time, what are the driving objectives of the industry as you see them? Well, I, I'll tell you. What, I mean, to be very, very honest, your conversation always starts with how do you reduce your carbon footprint, or how do you accelerate the decarbonization journey. But the conversation ends at return on investment, yeah. and yeah. no CFO is going to sign off on a project which is not financially viable. And I think that's where we sort of miss the train a little bit most of the time that we over-invest in technology or we oversize technology uh, more than needed. So I would say understand the business objective and keep the cost low. And, yeah. and the fastest ROI is the only way your proposal is going to go through a CFO. Yeah, no, I, I think that's great advice. And I think sometimes we forget because we're talking about construction and real estate and there's huge budgets um, and we were talking in terms of huge figures, but actually the margins are minuscule. And so people need to be aware of the commercial reality as well. So I think that's some really good advice. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, that's all we've time for today. That was Chintan Sunny, CEO of Equilibrium. My thanks as always to the producer, Katie Talon, and to the production team at Hear Me War Media. Before we go, just a special word of thanks to our sponsor, PropTech Ireland, for supporting the podcast and for making these conversations possible. And finally, thank you indeed for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next episode of the PropTech Hot Seat. In the meantime, please be sure to check out all of the other Irish and international real estate and construction shows here on iPropertyRadio.com. 